Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. If you'll take your Bible and turn it to the book of the Revelation, the fourth chapter. Reading the first 11 verses, or all 11 verses, I guess, of the chapter. John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, this passage of scripture. Father, may our worship today be like these elders who fell down before you to worship you, the one who lives forever and ever. Father, I pray for our worship time. We pray for Dave, our praise team, our instrumentalists, that you would use them to lead us in praise and worship. Father, for our pastor, we lift him up to you as he'll come to Proclaim the truth of your word from this passage, and Lord, would you anoint him and speak to us through him and help us to be obedient to your word. Draw men and women of all ages to yourself, and we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, on this second Advent Sunday, would you turn to four or five people? Tell them your first name so they'll know who they're worshiping with today. One, two, three. Amen. Well, Dave beat me to the punch when he said, some of y'all belong up here. You know it? But you know why you're not up here? It requires commitment. It requires hard work. Do you think they just got up this Sunday morning and said, let's sing this? No. It took time, and we praise the Lord for it. Well, this morning we're on part two. The way up and the way out. There's so much in Revelation chapter 4 that I knew I couldn't cover all in one service. I could have if y'all could have listened faster. So it's really not about me, okay? But we talked about what the rapture would be like. This trumpet sounds and we meet the Lord in the air. And like the scripture says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And with my sanctified imagination that is not always sanctified, (laughs) but I wonder that same cloud that received him up, is that the same cloud that he comes back in? 
What a glorious sight that'll be. Then immediately in the twinkling of an eye, caught up in God's throne room. And here possibly is that rewards judgment that the Bible speaks of. Seeing Jesus on his throne. And that sight is unbelievable. The Lord Jesus Christ in all of his Shekinah glory seated in the throne room of heaven. And the four and twenty elders, the redeemed, sins paid for, gathered around his throne. And the elders are representing the believers of all ages. Now notice the crowns. The Bible says in verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Verse 10 says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, and Now these crowns have been bestowed upon believers by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not something that they earned. They're something that God gave them. <clears throat> and it's good for us to know that these crowns are available to all believers. It's not just for an elect few. There's a lot of people that think, well, they're part of an inner circle. You can get into that circle the same way anybody else does, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's good for us to know these crowns. And we need to look at them for just a moment this morning. In no special order. One is the crown of life. In James 1.12, it reads, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, <clears throat> for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In other words, happy to be envied as a person who is patient under trial, stands up under temptation. When you've stood the test and you receive God's approval, <clears throat> you receive this victor's crown that God has promised to those that love him. And then there's the crown of righteousness that Paul writes about to Timothy. He says, For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. <clears throat> I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them, all those that love his appearing. <clears throat> you see, there's a crown of being right with the Lord. In other words, that's saved. That's justified. That's realizing that our sins have been paid for. And doing right. That's sanctified service. The old preacher daddy that I had so much respect for, <clears throat> Brother J. O. Folks. <clears throat> and when every time I read that passage, finishing well, I can't help but think of Brother Folks. He had cancer that was supposed to take him uh, at a short time, and for 12 years after they diagnosed it, he kept preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> His last... Preaching was a revival service and seated because he didn't have the strength to stand. He preached the gospel and in a little country church, 12 people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. <coughs> I was with his sons and daughter, daughters and when he was on his deathbed, he, uh, his old lips were cracked. His voice was hardly audible, and he motioned for me to come down to his ear. 
He didn't call me Butch, wouldn't call me Butch. He called me by my given name, Elton. And I put my ear down to his mouth to hear what he was going to say. And he said, Elton, talk to that male nurse. He's lost and he needs Jesus. That's the last words I ever heard him say. He finished well. And there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him. And not only for him, but all those that love his appearing. Well, there's a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now this has been referred to as the faithful <coughs> pastor's crown. And it's a crown I don't lie to you, I desire to have. To be one who studies the word, one who delivers it to people as they are, not because it's a chore, not for great financial gain, not lording it over the people, but being an example to the flock. No greater honor than to receive this crown of glory that will never fade away. It's interesting about this and other crowns and other gifts is you and I will never outgive the Lord. You realize it? That we'll never outgive the Lord. At this time of year, we take up a Christmas for Christ offering. <clears throat> it doesn't stay here. It goes to mission work, all the mission work that we support. Out give the Lord. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are not going to have this holy business meeting and say, how are we going to bless Butch? He's done so much for us. No, we'll never. I've never done anything for the Lord that he hasn't vastly, greatly blessed me more than I've ever been a blessing to him. Well, <clears throat> the scripture talks about the soul winner's crown. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, For what is our hope <clears throat> or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? <clears throat> Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now, it seems that wisdom leads a person inevitably to invest greater amounts of time and energy in the work of God's kingdom. Not knowledge, wisdom. Especially in the task of introducing other people to Christ. <clears throat> we ought to all long to see many people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the old hymn that convicts me, and because it convicts me, I don't sing it that much. It says, must I go in empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to bring him? Must I empty handed go? So many times we think of it as an easy practice, leading people to Christ. You know how Jesus describes it? He said it's like a woman giving birth. Now I have to go with Jesus on this. A woman when she is in travail has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. <clears throat> so it is when someone comes to Christ. We work with them. We pray with them. 
we share with them. And there's an effort that we have to put out to just share the gospel of Christ. But when that person receives the Lord Jesus Christ, it is worth it all. And we forget about the effort, but we rejoice that a child has been born into the kingdom. Well, there's the fifth crown is the mortar's crown. Revelation 2.10, Jesus said, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's a crown that is available <clears throat> for those who down through the ages have given their life for the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. Even to this day, there are Christians in our world that are giving their life for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the power of the gospel. Well, what should we learn from the crowns and their ultimate purpose? Verse 10 says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. They worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before him. Isn't there a singing group that's called Casting Crowns? They nail that one down. But we have to try to grasp this scene in heaven's throne room. The four and twenty elders are seated. <clears throat> now this is opposed to Revelation 20 where there are those who are standing before the throne. And when someone has been convicted, the judge says, will the defendant please rise or will the defendant please stand? These are not standing, they're seated because their sins have been paid for. They're, they're seated on these thrones around King Jesus' thrones and you, you have to grasp that. And on their heads are crowns of pure gold that Christ Jesus had given them. And they and us need to realize several things. One, I don't deserve to wear a crown. And neither do you. And neither do you. Thank you. Y'all were real good when it was just me. <laughs> but they realize, and we need to realize, that we're not worthy to wear a crown. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. Now, I think of where I am in glory, how I got there, the price that was paid, <clears throat> the only scars in all of heaven are the scars that Jesus had where the nails pierced his hands and pierced his feet. I'm trying to get Dave to let me sing and he's waiting for a blizzard. But I want us to sing Hallelujah Square. What a glorious time we'll all have up there. We'll sing and praise Jesus, his glory to share. And there'll not be a cripple. There'll not be any afflictions in Hallelujah Square. But in heaven, the only scars will be the scars that Jesus bore for me and for you. So I think of where I am, how I got there, the price of his precious blood that purchased my salvation, his unbelievable love for me, and I realize I can never repay him. How, with this welling up inside of me, how can I express to the Lord Jesus Christ my love for him? I know it's this crown that he's given me. And I'll take that crown and I'll bow before him and cast that crown at his feet. Now, it's interesting when King Jesus comes back to the earth, 
The Bible says all on his head were many crowns. That which we've cast at his feet in adoration he wears in adornment throughout all of eternity. Well, too, and this is so important, both now and eternally, if you leave with nothing else, you need to remember this. And if you're blessed enough to have a pen, you need to write it down. And that is this. We have to leave our throne to worship at his throne. We need to leave our throne to worship at his throne. Because most of what we do centers on us and our well-being, and our desires, and our likes. And if we're ever going to worship at his throne, like the four and twenty elders, we need to realize we need to leave our th throne to worship at his throne. So much of life is about us. We get pretty content and complacent sitting on our thrones. We're so excited or so occupied with ourselves in our throne, we fail to see Jesus on his throne. We catch a glimpse of that now and then, but our focus, our attention so many times is elsewhere. We have to leave our throne to worship at his throne. Well, notice the worship that takes place. Verse 7 through 10, it says, The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. <clears throat> and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Now the word beast is better translated living creature and there's so much here. The four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. The lion was the greatest of all wild animals. The ox, the greatest of all domestic animals. The eagle, the greatest of all flying creatures. And man, the greatest of all creation. Now, Ezekiel 113, Ezekiel writes and he says, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. What a wonderful, glorious scene that will be. Now, it's interesting that Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, he writes seeing Jesus as the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings. And that's the way Matthew conveys the gospel. Mark sees him as the perfect servant, the one who carries all of our burdens. You know, we cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And he sees him as that creature, that beast of burden that's carrying our needs, our problems, our trials. Luke writes of Jesus as being the perfect man. And as a physician, he details everything. You can't read it if it's like docs, but anyway, he chronicles all of it. And John shows the deity of Christ that's 
portrayed by the high-flying eagle. I love Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What a glorious time. Well, the Bible says these angelic hosts, day and night, are crying, Holy, 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 three times. Because He was holy in eternity past. He's holy in the present. And He will be holy forever in the future. His work of creation, holy. His work of redemption, holy. His work of consummation, holy. Well, in verse 9, Jesus receives glory and honor and thanks. Now, if the angels who cannot sing redemption story, if those angels can give thanks to the Lord himself, if the angels can do that, why can't we give thanks to him? Well, only the redeemed know the full meaning of thanksgiving. And even our faithfulness is made possible because of his faithfulness. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. In other words, worship him. Now the creation and the creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. What do you mean? They didn't come from slippery slime? They didn't just, was a tadpole one day and turned into a frog who turned into a person? They didn't come from a monkey. Now, I know some of that is hard to grasp. But all of a sudden, they evolved into this man that we see today. Man has not evolved, folks. Man has devolved. Man was created in the image of God. You can't get any better than that. But man, because of sin, fell. That's what the word is all about. Man fell. And one of the oldest books of the Bible is the book of Job. And Job cries out and he said, Isn't there a daysman somewhere that can get a hold of me and my fallen condition and get a hold of holy God and bring us together? And Job was prophesying of the Lord Jesus Christ who only could get a hold of fallen man and holy God and bring us together. And anybody that is saved has been reconciled to God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us who are saved, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Our purpose, our reason for being is to bring people who have been separated to God back to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Listen carefully and we'll open up Christ's invitation for your response. You and I have been created for one reason and that's to have fellowship with God. That's the only reason. We have been created by him and we have been created for him. And all of this is not whether you enjoyed the presentation, whether you enjoyed this. It's that you and I might realize I have been created by God for fellowship with God. 
that he desires. I don't understand that. He desires my company. And he desires your company. Because we have been created by him for fellowship with him. Listen, Jesus is on his way back. He's on his way back. Are you ready to meet him? Because let me tell you something. If you're saved, you're going to be caught up in the air to meet him in the air. If you're not saved, you'll be sent a strong delusion that you might believe a lie that those who have not received him, that they all might be damned, who had pleasure in unrighteousness rather than pleasure in, in the Lord. That's a tough saying, but it's a true saying. And so to know him personally in the free pardon of sin, you've got to get off your throne, and you've got to come to his throne and agree with God, Lord, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. Would you forgive me of my sin and come into my heart and life and save me? And if you do, you'll miss what we're going to be preaching on this terrible, terrible tribulation period. Terrible. A lot of people don't want to hear about it, but God has it recorded. People grinding their teeth to powder, but they won't repent. I mean, when I hear somebody do that on a chalkboard, I climb the wall. But to grind teeth, to powder and not repent. People chewing their tongues off for pain. Well, let me tell you something. When I bite my tongue, it gets out of the way. It looks for a safe place. <laughs> but literally chewing their tongues off and not repenting. You know why? Today is the day of salvation. Everybody here, everybody here, God's given us today. One day, one breath, one heartbeat, that's all we have. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do? If you're here and you're not saved, <coughs> sometimes we use these words, saved, redeemed, born again, born again believer. But to say, if you're here and you don't know without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord Jesus has come into your heart and changed you, made you like unto himself, given you his desires, if you don't know without a shadow of a doubt that if anything happened to you, you'd be with the Lord, then there's a good, strong possibility you need to be saved today. And you can do it. He can do it. Because he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the ball is in your court. If you've never been saved, it's not Jesus' fault. He paid it all. It's not God the Father's fault. He sent his only begotten Son. It's not the Holy Spirit's fault. He's taken the word and dealt with each one of us where we're at and sought to lead us to Christ. The ball is in your court. Whosoever will may come. You can come today. Some of you need to lead others. You need to step out. You've been saved, but you've never followed the Lord as a believer in scriptural baptism. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with obedience. It has everything to do with identification, his death, burial, and resurrection. And maybe some of you are saved, you've been identified, but you don't have a church home. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You walk the aisle, you say, I've been saved, I've been scripturally baptized, and I want to plant my life here because the Lord has led me here. We'd love to see people make that decision for him. Would you stand and would you pray? Father, we thank you for your word today, for your presence in all that we've heard. Father, the gospel, the testimony in song, 
Father, we, it, it, it touches our heart. It speaks to our minds of what this is all about. And Father, for your word, so clear, so pure, and for the Holy Spirit that will take the word and deal with each one of us, for God's promise that his word would never return empty or void, but it will always accomplish that for which he sent it forth and it will prosper thereby. So Father, today we pray for that prosperity in people's hearts that they'll come to Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.